Um, thanks, everybody. So um, if everybody has the note doc, this is a running notes document, which includes not only the notes from the meetings when we're all together, but the planning sessions that Charles and James and sometimes Nia and I um, are doing for this group. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that is in the chat. Um, and we can send out the a link to the those notes later as well. So um, we met in July, who's a little while ago, um, and wanted to get a sense, uh, well, give everybody a sense of the responsibilities of this group, um, which we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the arc of that and how we're adjusting it. Uh, but basically, the you know the responsibilities. We're kind of breaking that into four categories. One was design with member participation, the purpose, roles, and structure of the board. The second was design with member participation, the election process. Then three is help facilitate the election process. Four, help establish board structure, including leadership development, drafting bylaws, establishing culture. I think people can drop, uh, by being in this group, you don't have to follow through with all of that. I think at different points, we'll have different combinations of people getting involved with those different steps. And now we're adding a step at the beginning, which is just learning about how other groups have created boards, um, doing, doing more learning before we do the designing. Um, and we had, which actually we kind of, we did with our first, we started doing with our first meeting um, and we're going to continue doing with deeper dive into um, these individual um, experiences and uh, knowledge banks uh, when, and Lisa's giving, giving us our first, first presentation. Um, but we have, we went around and talked about everybody's experience on on boards or organizing boards and kind of what works and what doesn't work just to get us just to collect you know get a really high level um, collection of of information and guidance um, there is a th that all that's all in the notes um, but there is also a um, a document that summarizes all of that um, where i put that into like a chart into different categories um, people talked about accessibility, um, and that link I just put in the notes, by the way, representation and accountability, responsibilities, utility, support, makeup, structure. So um, then, so we have this collected, I think we'll probably revisit this and just keep keep finding ways to make sure we're, we're collecting and writing down um, the lessons that we're learning uh, in the next few sessions. Um, then we also started Charles and I had drafted a survey, just like what is, I mean, and it didn't have to be used as a survey, but just to get a sense of like, okay, what are the type, what's the types of information that we want to be learning from members? Like what, what are members lacking right now? And so we could try to put the pieces together and figure out how a board could support members more. Um, and so that part we'll revisit after um, after these learning sessions, um, once we turn around to, to start talking with members um, about their experiences and their needs, um, as assuming that through this learning, uh, that's still the path we want to take um, to to design this board. So that is the summary. Anything that folks want to add? Um, I think everybody here was there at our last meeting. Sweet. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to James to talk more about some of the yeah the revisions and changes that we're making to that arc. Hi everyone. Um, FYI, this is also the the the, the schedule for today. Um, as you can see, we're right here. Um, review of the ARC. Um, and yeah, so as um, Hendrix mentioned, um, there has been sort of a, a sort of schedule on, and how we're thinking about this like learning. Um, and to just sort of underscore the learning, I think that we recognize that um, some of the answers that we were seeking were actually in our community with the people that we're, we're, we're working with. Um, and more than anything, we felt like, why are we like thinking about Designed so like urgently when we when we have space and and an opportunity to learn from 
um, folks in our community that are have actually done a lot of this stuff um, in, in a lot of different ways. And so really want to identify folks in the, in the ecosystem that could hopefully share their learnings with us um, before we enter into this like process. Um, and so, as you know, um, this September, uh, we have Lisa, um, and then October, we have Ruby and Amari, October 27th specifically, I hope you all can um, join, sent out that invite. Um, and following that, we have Corey Thomas, um, who's a Black CEO of this like tech startup um, company, um, and uh, really excited actually for him to offer his, his expertise um, related to just corporate boards. Um, I think more than anything, we wanted sort of a variety of different experiences and learnings as it relates to board development. And um, he's really someone that we're excited to bring on who can offer us some of that is insight. Um, that doesn't always necessarily, uh, it's not always as present in, in our community, but is valuable in its own way. Um, and we figured December would take some, some space um, December is often a really hectic month, um, and and actually more recently we just talked about maybe we can like sort of summarize our first three sessions in that in that at that moment and and present it to um, you all and members. Um, and I also want to name that you know we'll be recording these sessions and and also as um, Ujima we'll be sending them out to our members. So members will be learning with us throughout this process. It won't be sort of a like. At this moment, members now have access to the conversations we're having. Um, they'll be sort of in, interacting with us um, if they choose to be, um, as we're like learning this uh, or hearing from all these folks. Um, so just want to name that. And so December, we're thinking that we'll take some space um, and then pivot into um, uh, January. We will have Mariama um, White Hammond from New Roots speak on her experience. Uh, which is pretty vast in a lot of different spaces um, and then have a TBD right now. Um, but our hope is to secure someone um, who has like a development background um, in particular, I think really engaging, really offering learnings from someone, um, a development professional who has to interact with the board and, and really thinking about how a board could really be leveraged to support fundraising. It's a great opportunity, I think. And so I think her, I'm sure everyone is gonna speak, speak on that, but um, I think coming from her, her specific specialized perspective could be really valuable. So still still figuring out what that's gonna be, but just give you an FYI. And then from February to um, April, really having space for collective de design with members. Um, as I mentioned, members will be privy to this, this learning, but um, that is when we'll have an intentional time to really integrate this learning with them and and, and also hear um, their their offerings around this work and how they see this, this shifting. Um, so yeah, that is the arc um, for this process. Um, uh, we also, I also want to give space for folks if you guys feel like this is extended too long or if you guys want some, um, a bit more, um, uh, want this to be a shorter process, also offer, offer space for folks to share that. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of thought that went into mind with, in determining this, this sort of cadence, um, and for folks that are going to be learning with us here, uh, also want to give space, uh, for folks to suggest otherwise. So yeah, so feel free to throw something out or let email me. Happy to, to uh, hear what y'all think. And now, um, uh, if there aren't any pressing responses or questions, I will pivot to Nia, who will introduce our, our guest today, our friend, our homie. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, so I'm going to introduce Lisa Owens, who is the executive director of uh, City Life Vida Urbana, which is a housing justice organization that works for racial, social, and economic justice and gender equity by fighting displacement and building super, and I'm sorry, and building community power. Lisa has been actively involved in building grassroots organizations for over 25 years. A seasoned educator, she also occasionally teaches courses at area colleges on structural racism, community organizing, and nonprofit management and leadership. So it's a perfect segue into our presentation from Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Nia. Um, and thanks, Ujima, for inviting me um, to be part of this process. I'm really excited to learn from all of our homies on the call. Um, so I am going to start this off by saying a little bit about my experience in boards. 
Um, then I'm going to share a few slides. Um, I will share um, not all of the content on the slides, but I will make sure that the slides are available for you as you disseminate this outward um, to the rest of the membership. So the slides themselves are kind of like the, the nuts and bolts of boards. It's kind of like a board 101 class in a nutshell. Um, and then the last thing I'll do is just say what some of these practices have made possible in my own organization. I'm going to do all of that in trying to do that in about 10 minutes, no more than 15 minutes, so that we can talk about this stuff. Um, all right. So, so I um, have been part of boards, um, either as a as a board member or as an executive director for yeah, like over 25 years. Um, and I have so, and that experience has been everything from being a participant um, among many participants that, you know, not, not much was expected of me, so I didn't, you know, contribute very much, you know, just kind of go to the regular meetings, all the way up to um, a very extremely highly involved board um, that um, really used its board member as staff, um, so, you know, doing programmatic work. Um, and so, and in these like range of experiences, some of them were very, very informally organized, um, not even nonprofit and very informally organized groups to formally organized grassroots groups to um, foundation boards. Um, I think those are the three types. Um, so, so I, what I can say is that I have seen a lot of things work very poorly um, and that kind of spurred my initiative to try to figure out, uh, especially once I was an executive director, to say, how can this look, um, how can this feel better as an executive director? How can this be a better experience for board members? And how can we use this structure that is a legally required structure to actually serve the mission um, of the organizations that we're part of? Um, so that's why I'm really interested in boards working well. And, um, and sometimes I teach this to my students. I definitely have used some of these slides with my own board. Um, and at City Life, we have gone through a process of reorganization um, of our governance structure so that our board can be more integrated into the life of the organization without stepping into actual staff programmatic work, which is a really important distinction to make. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about what these practices have made possible. But first, let me go through some of these slides. And definitely somebody flag me if um, my audio starts to lag. Okay. All right, so, um, so I'm gonna pretty quickly go through uh, board 101. So, so a good board, um, has board members that know the legal duties of a nonprofit board member. And as a board, you are fulfilling the three main roles of a board. So individual board members have the duties of care, loyalty, and obedience. Um, and you'll hear this whenever you go to, this is pretty standard board training stuff. So the duty of care means that you actually are paying attention to what the organization is doing, um, that you are doing more than like I was doing in some of my early board experiences, just sitting in a chair and eating the donuts, right? You're actually paying attention to what is happening in the life of the organization well beyond board meetings. And, you are pay and you're paying attention both when things go well and when things aren't going so well. Um, so that's the duty of care. The duty of loyalty is, as a board member, it's our job to put the interests of the organization ahead of our personal and professional interests. 
So that means, for example, if you are in a situation where um, the organization is making a decision that impacts your personal or professional life, you state those, those conflicts openly, and as a board, you make a determination about how to address um, those um, perceived or actual conflicts of interest. And when you're making decisions, you are putting the, the mission of the organization ahead of your own personal interests. And the duty of obedience is just making sure that, that as a board, you're in compliance with all applicable laws um, and that you are staying true to your bylaws. So those are the duties of, of individual board members. And the three main roles of the board itself is to establish an organizational identity. So that means um, making sure that the organization is, um, has effective planning, making sure that the organization has a process for developing a mission if it's new or revisiting its mission and purpose periodically so that you can make sure that the organization is um, is, is staying on focus. You know, uh, board members can see themselves as like the, the moral compass or the mission compass for the organization. Um, the role is to ensure resources. So this is pretty important. Board members have to make sure that there are adequate financial resources for the organization. This is really about ensuring resources for the ongoing sustainability of the organization. So um, it doesn't mean that every board member is, is actively involved in fundraising, although every board member should have a role in fundraising, but it does, make, it does mean, for example, that there's a process for the board to um, collectively decide on a budget. And, and there's a process for um, making sure that there are adequate financial resources to um, to, to um, work your mission. Um, under this category is also selecting the executive director or the CEO or the president, wherever you call your top executive. Um, it's the board's role to make sure that the people who are on the board deserve to be there, right? So board service isn't a right and it shouldn't be like, um, you know, like, um, like a kingship or something. You should, the board's role is, is to make sure that the people who are on the board have the, the skills and um, represent the constituencies that make sense for the organization in the moment and to fulfill its mission. And then lastly, under ensuring resources, making sure that the organization has a good public image, right? And so board members obviously shouldn't go bad mouthing the organization, also, the, the board members should be, should be aware of the organization's reputation in the community. Um, and then lastly, providing oversight. I think this is what most people know about. Um, so oversight, sorry, y'all. Oversight of the executive director, oversight of the programs, oversight of the budget, oversight over compliance making sure that there are systems in place so that these things happen. All right. So there are a number of best practices um, that, are, that I sort of listed at the end of this presentation that I won't go over, um, but there are a few that I do wanna just highlight. So one is um, meeting attendance. So this really should go without saying, but board members should have a clear expectation that that showing up is, is the first thing. It's not the last thing, but it's the first thing that they need to be doing. So, um, and they should sign a contract at the beginning of their term saying that they agree to um, being present, right? And so in our board uh, contract, um, people know that um, that 75% of the meetings are required, and if you dip below 75%, then you, um, you set yourself up for a conversation around, do you really wanna be here? Board limits or term limits is actually another piece that, that I would recommend every board 
member um, having some guidelines around. So there are some boards where they have they just have a problem of of people staying beyond their usefulness. Um, and if you have term limits spelled out in your bylaws, that um, that can be um, a very sort of um, graceful way for people to to transition into other roles in the organization. Um, so these are some best practices, and there are more, obviously, but for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them. So in terms of compliance, super important. Um, the board should spell out, um, ideally in its bylaws, how frequently it meets. Um, the board should have policies around executive compensation, and I would also say comp compensation scale for the rest of its employees. The board should make sure that, um, that the 990 is filed every year. And if you are um, subject to an audit, that the audit is, um, is performed and, you, and the board should meet with the auditor um, right after the audit is completed. Um, the board should make sure that there are policies around document destruction and, and whistleblowers. And, okay. So the last thing that I'll do is just say um, a few things about what it means to be a good board member. So the relationship between the board chair and the executive director should be a fruitful, generative, supportive relationship. The board chair should really take, take on the charge of, of making sure that the board itself um, has functioning committees and has adequate um, sort of uh, communication between board members and the executive director. The board chair should know how to run meetings, how to create agendas, and really should be meeting with the executive director in between meetings to work on organizational issues. Um, good board members um, listen a lot and actively participate, right? Um, so, so this is sort of, this is a tension between, you know, knowing when you're talking, you're taking up too much space and not listening enough, or when you're just sitting back and eating the donuts and not participating enough. Um, so board members should know your personal balance and get feedback from other people if you're not clear about that. Board members should definitely understand the role, the line between the executive, uh, the executive director and the board. So the board does not, um, should not be involved in programmatic and program related activities. The board is not staff. The board empowers the executive director to run the organization and the board provides support, guidance, mentorship, um, those kinds of things. The board, the board ensures that there's a plan for sustainability and oversees that, but the board is not staff. Um, and there are some organizations that need the board to be staff um, early on but as soon as you're able to hire staff, the board really should function, should transition to a governance function. The board, board members should absolutely ask what you, what you consider to be naive questions. There, um, there are very few bad questions. And if you have a question, it's super important to ask because one, it's your job, it means you're paying attention. But two, it means other people have your questions, um, and it, it encourages this um, sort of this, this this culture of learning together. Board members should should serve as ambassadors for the organization. You should speak openly and publicly. Should be on panels and radio shows and sharing all of your information on social media, et cetera. Obviously, um, in collaboration with with the executive director. And then lastly, good board members are excited about being board members. You're excited about rolling up your sleeves. You're excited to follow the, the leadership of the executive director when necessary. You're excited to provide good direction when necessary. You see yourself as partners with the director and the staff. Um, so what I'll, what I'll close by saying is that 
at City Life, um, when I first joined the organization, we had um, we had a board that I would say was super um, um, supportive of the mission, and and many people actually on the board had been founders or friends of founders. Um, but the board, there was there was a disconnect between what happens in board in board meetings and the rest of the life of the organization. And I found myself for the first, um, and I actually, I should say, I was president of the board for two years before I was on, um, before I became executive director. And I was, and I was on the board for four years. So I had a good sense of the culture of the board. Um, I knew that people were sort of longing to figure out how they could be more of service. Um, and there wasn't necessarily direction for us as board as board members. So we listened patiently, we asked good questions about what was happening, but we weren't really, um, our expertise wasn't really being tapped in, the, in a way that I think it could have been. And so when I came on board, um, I had lots of conversations with the board and the staff um, and our leadership team, and we redesigned our governance structure so that the board's role was was almost entirely focused on sustainability. The, the, the leadership team's role, um, which is a member leadership team, took on more traditional board function because they were much more involved in the day-to-day -day life of the organization. And then, and, and structurally, the executive team of our leadership, of our member leadership team, serve on the board. So three, the three executive committee members of our leadership team are also on the board. And so they can provide that really important perspective. Um, and it's also a way to grow the board um, um, kind of from our membership. And so what's been possible actually has been that we've been able to um, increase the number of member leaders on our board um, who are actively participating and not just sort of sitting back. We've been able to deepen the learning of all of our board members. We changed our structure so that our board actually is one part, um, one part learning and then one part decision making. So for example, when it's time to do the budget, um, the first part of the board meeting is actually a board training on, on some part of, of, of reading financial statements or um, one part looking at what our goals are for the next for the next period and how the budget should reflect those goals, how the budget can support those goals. So we do uh, board learning and then people are asked to use that information in real time to make decisions. Um, so the structural changes of, of incorporating the leadership team, uh, embedding them more in the board and changing the board um, to being more of a learning board and lastly, we changed our meeting schedule. So we actually meet quarterly now instead of monthly. And we provided other spaces within the organization for people to learn about the day-to-day -day work of the organization, or um, I give director's reports at an open meeting now, not just at the board meeting. And so board members found other ways to be connected to the life of the organization. Um, and that's changed it, those three changes have definitely, I think, increased people's um, sense of connection and also their leadership in the organization. So I'll stop there and, um, yeah, and open it up to questions. I'd love to know sort of what reflections you have about anything that I, that I shared. Um, and if you have examples of, of organizations that are using some of these best practices, which I will put back up on the screen, Definitely shout out those organizations and those practices as well. Yeah, I just want to say, um, Nia, but in the chat, do you have any diagrams slash charts of city life governance structures? I do. Um, it's not it's not a diagram. It's more in narrative form, but I can definitely share that. I can definitely share that. And it sounds like there's there's a member member leadership committee or and there's a or there's a member leadership board and an executive committee of that board that 
and three members are part of the board of directors. Did I get that right? Yeah, so our so our structure is um, there are three bodies that make um, that that make um, governance type decisions. So we've got the staff and the board and the leadership team. The staff are the staff, right? The board are is a small group of people. Um, at this point, it's like one third people who have been in city life for a really long time, long term supporters. And then two thirds people who um, have been in the organization somewhere between, you know, like five and fifteen years, um, who are who came because of because they themselves had a case, a displacement case, and they stayed to be leaders. Um, it's a very small board. We're up to I think eleven people now, and three of those board members, um, minimum, are on are part of the leadership team. Those are, that's the executive committee. Um, and then obviously other people can also come from the membership as well. So the staff, the board, and then the leadership team is a 25 to 30 person um, uh, leadership body, um, almost entirely people who came because of their own cases. 80% of our leadership team has to be um, what we call our base. And then 20% and then can be allies. At this point, I think something like 90 to 95 percent of the people are from our base, um, and we have limits. We have quotas around, you know, people of color and gender composition, that kind of thing. So right now we have 26 people, and those 26 people elect three people to be on the executive committee. And the executive committee of the leadership team works very closely with um, with me and with and with other um, organizing staff to plan campaigns, to make sure that committees are functioning, to serve as spokespeople for the organization. You know, they, they do a lot. Um, they do what a board president might do in a traditional board, right? And so those three members of the executive committee serve on the board as well. One is you said you moved from monthly meetings to quarterly meetings. Can you s explain why? And then the second is you said we have a small board, 11 people, and you have a leadership team, 25 to 30 people. Um, I know people who would say 11 people is not small. I know some boards that have three people. Can you just kind of talk about, um, yeah, size and board, uh, I know of a board that had 60 people that definitely seems like way too many people. So I'm just curious about yeah. the perspective on, on numbers of people and decision making, et cetera. Yeah, okay. Well, so for the first thing about why we changed our meeting schedule, um, they're actually, they're actually what, we didn't have 12 months of meeting topics for the board actually. Um, it, it, did, it didn't make sense. Um, in our old structure, um, even meeting so often, um, the board members needed to meet so often because they wanted to be more connected to the life of the organization. But that's not really a reason to meet as a board. Instead, we created other opportunities for other people to be involved in the life of the organization, to get information. For example, I do a monthly state of the organization meeting, which um, is basically an extended director's report. So I talk about the financial health of the organization. I talk about any major changes that have happened with staff or administration. And then I'll highlight um, a piece, a, a, an issue for discussion. Could be organizing, could be related to coalitions or policy. But that's the thing that people really wanted in the board meeting, but that, that should be shared widely. And so I took that piece out of the board meeting and made it more of a public thing. And then the board itself, it, it could focus on what, it re, what we needed it to do, which is to, over, which is to really be a sustainability committee, right? So, the, so our board has a few major functions. It makes sure it it um, makes it goes reviews the annual plan for the year. Um, the board also should be in charge of larger uh, strategic planning processes. 
the board um, uh, makes sure that the audit happens and then reviews the audit and has a meeting with the auditor um, to make sure um, that, that, the, that the internal functioning um, is correct. Um, the board has an annual retreat in January where it um, takes stock of the last six months and makes sure that we are on target. Um, it also reviews our fundraising plan and makes, and, and makes some decisions about whether we need to shift our budgetary priority for the remaining six months. And then the board um, um, participates in the annual budget process for the following fiscal year. Um, and that's where those trainings on um, on reading financial statements and that kind of thing happens. So that's that's what our board does. And anything else that is that sort of gets thrown into the board, we took out and we sort of divided between staff and the leadership team. Um, and then you were talking about size. So in terms of size. Um, our board has been as small as like four people, four or five people, and has been, I think, as large as maybe somewhere between 13 and 16 people. Um, 11 to 13 is a good size for us um, um, because you have because you have people who can actually um, populate committees, which is super important. Um, so that's our optimal size. We would not like a, size, a board, any board of 60 people. Um, it's just a little too unwieldy, I think. But our leadership team um, works really well. And 25 to 30 is a is sort of a, it's a good size for us because we need to, we want to make sure that we have representation from the different committees and the different geographical areas um, that our tenant associations are in. Any other any other questions about city life or about other boards that do any of these things particularly well? I just um, I put some questions in the chat around mm -hmm. fundraising and you know I know with boards a lot of times there's like a, a disconnect either they're like only a fundraising board or they're not really fundraising at all or they do it through an event. Um, so I was just curious to see. Um, how that fundraising responsibility works. And then also how you all make decisions if they're based on consensus, two thirds, majority. Um, Cause you know, I'll just speak personally in my organization, we, um, we struggle, we do two thirds majority, but usually like the one or two folks that are anti something are the ones that kind of get pushed under the rug and then there's feelings, you know? So, yep. um, so I'm just, those are, you know, just for my personal knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So for fundraising, um, we have found that um, we, we just decided to, to, to take what, what had been already happening in the organization and to just like say, okay, this is how we're going to do things. So for a long time, we have, we have been like trying to push and push and push board members to um, do fundraising tasks that they weren't excited about and perhaps didn't have skill around and it just took too much time uh, from me um, when clearly the, the structure was just not working for our needs so um, so we actually have so we have obviously staff dedicated to fundraising and the staff um, are um, leading a fundraising committee and we're, we're still actually playing with what the right structure is. But for right now, our uh, development director is leading what we're calling radical redistribution training, which is basically a series of trainings that um, get people excited about the principles of grassroots fundraising, um, introduce them to some tools, and then ask people to, um, to take some action related to grassroots fundraising for city life. Um, and that that training um, kind of mirrors another leadership development training that we have called the 100 cadre which um, is also sort of a like a like an entry entryway into leadership at city life you come to this training it's a three-part training you you learn some concepts you learn some skills and then you you pledge to take some action on behalf of city life with the skills that you've learned so we're using that model for our fundraising. Um, and so 
so far, you know, we, we have a small core of, pe- core of people who are super excited about it. Um, but, you know, we're still in the first year of implementing, so I'll let you know how it happens. And just lastly, on decision making, um, we try for consensus, and when we can't do consensus, we do majority, just just straight majority vote. Yeah, and I think that's probably time. Uh, um, thanks. Oh, wait, we can't ask one more question. One more question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, one more question. Um, yeah, I appreciate you underscoring board limits because um, I'm also a fan of those, and also kind of feel similar about staff limits. I think that could be a thing. But i um, curious to know what, uh, from my experience with board limits, it, it gets tricky, especially when it's like a board member that is particularly supportive or like integral to like the organization. Um, what has been your experience in like navigating, you know, because sometimes what I've seen a lot in my nonprofit experience has been like, they'll just renew their like, their like bird board term, right? Like after they'll just sort of redefine or not redefine, but like just completely just start a whole new experience. And and I don't know, is, is that sort of that, um, is that sort of uh, described in your sort of the details of board limits, sort of like someone's ability to uh, renew a term or is it like, what does that usually look like from your experience? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um... So I, I can say what um, I so what what the I think the general um, wisdom is around term limits is that you should have a governance committee. The governance committee should um, should create a should create a proposal that that ultimately gets board buy-in on term limits. You know whether it's you know you have this many terms and that's it. Thank you very much. Or you have this many terms. You can take a pause and then come back, but you know the wisdom is that a governance committee should should set that should set that in writing. You should vote on it, and you sh- it should just sort of be drama free. Everybody knows when their term limit is up. You know, thank you very much for your service. Um, in our case, we and probably in the case of a lot of non a lot of very small nonprofits, we rely on that kind of organizational wisdom. Um, and deep dedication. And so we, so what I do actually, um, we still have not determined what our board limits are. We're still in this conversation, Um, but I have conversations with each of the board members and I'm just really honest with folks. Like I realize that you are a strong supporter. We need you here. Um, Sometimes I have said, we really could use your effort over here. How would you feel about instead of being a board member, leading this effort over here. Um, and yeah, and some, sometimes those conversations um, can be sort of, yes, obviously, yes, I'm there. Sometimes it's a longer conversation, but it's all in love because we all are deeply committed to the work of the organization. The last thing I'll say is that with our leadership team, though, we actually, um, do have term limits. We have one year limits. They voted that in themselves and they were very adamant that the work is so hard. You you really can't ask people to do this for longer than a year without them actively choosing to Mm re-up. So at the end of the year's term, um, there's a small group of people who have conversations, individual conversations with each and every leadership team member. So that's 26 to 30 people and you and you give an assessment. You ask them for their assessment. How did they how did they think they, they did over the last year? Did they accomplish what they wanted to accomplish? How do you think we did? And then we give our assessment of their leadership. Um, and we either recommend that they continue to serve or recommend that they serve in a different capacity and not on the leadership team. And um, that and that process has been working really, really well for us. And that's the kind of process that I want to transition over to the board. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you for having me. I will pass it back over to you, James, or Charles, or whoever's running this. <laughs> pass it over to Charles. Cool. <laughs> or, or do you want, or should I close it? <laughs> I, well, I... Charles put a question in the chat, by the way. Did you I did. You said for later, but maybe just to at least read it out loud if there's not enough time to answer. 
Yeah, Charles, you want to read it? Sure. Sorry, I also realized there's a truck moving in the background. I apologize for that. Um, the question I had, and it is, yeah, perhaps for later, you mentioned that the board is pivoted to focus exclusively on sustainability. I was wondering if this is financial sustainability or the maintenance of institutional memory, particularly from the folks who have been there and supporting the work for a while, um, or something else entirely. But given that we yeah. don't have much time. Yeah. The very quick answer is organizational sustainability, and that entails a whole lot. Um, and I'm happy to write something up and send it to you. I would appreciate that. That would be excellent. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate you making time to share your experience with us. Um, super helpful. Um, and uh, just to let everyone know, our next one is October 27th. We'll have Ruby, our very own Ruby Reyes here. Um, and Amari Jeffries from King Boston will be sharing their knowledge and their experience with us. Um, so super excited. Hopefully you all can um, attend. Um, feel free to reach out to Charles, Hendrix, or myself if you guys have any questions. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.